We're going to do something a little different this week. We're, uh, I'm going to preach and teach for about 10-15 minutes. That short, believe it or not. And, and, and then Mark's going to try and preach for 10-15 to 15 minutes. So... Uh, <laughs> So probably 40 minutes and an hour and a half will probably be about where we're at. That's why we brought dinner. You thought it was lunch. Aha, you're here. <laughs> Let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we're so thankful for each and every soul that is alive here today. God, you created each and every one. You created them with your own hands. You knit us together, as your word says, in, in our mother's womb. We're so thankful that you gave us this breath of life to live. And ultimately, your desire, your purpose is that we might know you and enter into real life, into the dance with you. So Father, help us to have ears to hear not only what Mark and I say, but more importantly, what the Holy Spirit says to each and every person here today. For it's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. You know, I love the first four words of the Bible. And I think most people can remember that first four words. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. And what is God? Well, John tells us that God is love. God is light. God is spirit. And out of His love, He creates each and every person. Each and every one of us that are here. And yet, you know the story, if you've ever been in Sunday school for any time, that there was a rebellion, there was a desire to live independent of God, to take the reins, so to speak, and say, I'll make my own choices apart from your love and life, God. Even though you were the one that created me, I will be my own. And that was the rebellion of Adam and Eve, and that was where sin entered, and separation from that sin entered. But you have to remember that God is love and He wasn't going to have it that way. And yet in that rebellion and in that waywardness, we see Adam avoiding God. He runs into the bushes and God calls out, Adam, Adam, where are you? And there's this response, this response of the soul. God, here I am. I was afraid for what I had done. I was afraid of you for what I've done. But yet God is the one, if you look at the story, chasing after Adam, the one that is in his sin. And God calls out to Adam. And ultimately, he's restoring Adam. And God's heart was for restoration to take place. His heart, if you remember, is to love those that he created because God himself is love. And just like Adam, many of us are still hiding in the bushes, hiding away from God. Even though we know about this God, we reckoned in our own life that there is a God. We just don't know if this is a God that will love us, that one that we can trust. We've been told lies much of our lives that this is being a God that is out to smite us, a God that's out to hurt us. And so in our very natural instinct, we run away from this God because we've been told lies about this God. And yet God continues to call out to each and every one of us. And even in their rebellion, there was a resounding no within the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They weren't going to have man live separated from them. And that they would do whatever it takes to bring mankind back into this union, into relationship with Him. And so there was a plan and there was a purpose placed within the Godhead, that one day that He would bring man back and there would be no more separation. And even Christ comes, He doesn't come with a resounding thunder and lightning that there's going to be, man, you will not live separate from Me. No, He comes very humbly. He comes, as the Christmas story would have it, the baby in the manger. Humbly coming to His people. Philippians 2, 6 and 7 says, Although Christ was truly God, He did not try to remain equal to God. Instead, he gave up everything and became a slave when he became like one of us. See, this God is not far away. 
This God doesn't under, is not one that is like the false pagan gods that were waiting up there for man to, to do something. This God is the God that loves so much that He comes and He strips Himself of everything to come as one of us. Humbly in a manger, not even having a bed. Now this wasn't man's thought. They were looking at the time of Jesus coming for this conquering God, this conquering king that would come in and take control, this government force that would take control and, and set everybody else straight because, you know, we had it straight. So we needed a conquering king to come in and set everybody straight, to take revenge on the enemies. Yet that wasn't the way that God had it. In fact, it says God's ways are not our ways. And yet we try to create God in our own image instead of just understanding, embracing, and realizing that God is in His own image, that this is a God of love, light, and spirit. And Matthew, Matthew tells us that this Messiah, this long-awaited Yeshua HaMashiach, which means Savior of the world, was coming. And He said that He would come to set the captives free by utterly vanquishing separation. In Matthew 12, you see that. That's the purpose. That's the desire that God has. That He wanted to not allow us to be separated. Sure, we can allow ourselves through that. We can run away from God. We can act as if there is no God, but He didn't have that. In Matthew 12, He said He'll bring judgment to victory, which means to utterly vanquish any source of separation between them and us. And when he cried out his last words, it is finished, it was. I take God at his word. We have to say, well, what was finished? When he said it was finished, it was all finished. Everything was completely changed at that very moment. In fact, there was an earthquake that even took place. And there was a, a veil that would separate gods and the holiest of holies from the inner court. And that veil was torn. And the Bible tells us it was torn from top to bottom. A symbol of who did the tearing. Not man. This wasn't man's plan. God did the tearing, saying, no, there's no more separation. You enter into my holy of holies. You enter into me. That's, this, that's no more separation that would take place. Yet if we don't know this, it becomes irrelevant to us. Or if we fail to hear not only this audible gospel going out through these speakers, but the internal gospel of a God that has known us, and we become callous to this message of who this God is, we continue like Adam, hiding in the bushes, running away from the God that has breathed His very life into us. And this is the, for, this is the gospel message that goes forward today. It's a picture of what baptism, when Mark speaks that, it's a picture of what baptism is. So who was on the cross when it was said it was finished? Don't answer out loud, but think in your heart. Who was on that cross? If you've ever been to Sunday school, the answer is always Jesus. I mean, that's, that's the easy answer. We always say Jesus. And, and if you were there and you said Jesus was on that cross and said it was finished, well, you are kind of correct, but not fully correct. See, because that's the part of the gospel that we've been told about Jesus dying on the cross for us. But we haven't been told the rest of the gospel. Well, what is the rest of the gospel? The rest of the gospel is that each and every one of us was on that cross with Jesus. We, our old self, has died. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, One has died for all. And we amen that. Amen. And we amen that. One, Jesus Christ has died for all. Do you know what the next word is there? Therefore, three little words, all have died. We've somehow been blinded to the fact that we realize that it was Jesus that died, but we've been blinded to the fact that we too have died. Paul makes this very personal, and as we grasp a hold of his words, it becomes very personable to us too. Where he says in Galatians 2.20, and I'll read it in a version called the BBE. It's the basic Bible, which is good for me. I need a basic Bible sometimes. It says, I have been put to death on the cross with Christ. Still I am living, but no longer I, but Christ is living in me. And that life which I now am living in the flesh, I live by the faith, the faith of the Son of God that, who loved me and gave himself up for me. And see, there's the gospel. 
It isn't only about Jesus dying for the forgiveness of your sins. It's about your old self dying and Him recreating you new. You were first born in Adam. Born as a sinner. Sinner by nature. But then recreated in Christ. Now when He said it was finished, that part is finished. But there is still another part. If I may draw an illustration to kind of a modern movie that most of you guys know, uh, the movie The Matrix. We see the main character, Thomas Anderson, the businessman, you know, that was sitting at his computer and he knew there had to be more to life than what was going on. And he continued looking into the computer and there became this kind of rabbit hole that he started going into. And then one day he's sitting chair to chair with a guy named Morpheus. And Morpheus, let me give you the quote right from the movie, offers him the ability to see life as it actually is. See, he had been living under this illusion that the things that he was doing was real life. And Morpheus says, no, no, that's not real life. I can show you real life. I can tell you about it, but you can only not only know about it, you have to experience it. The only way to experience it is to take this red pill. Or you can go back living your life as if none of this was real and living under the delusion of separation, living under the delusion of a purposeless life living under the delusion and take this blue pill. Well, if you've seen the movie, you know that Neo, which was Thomas Anderson's character, has a name change. He now sees real life because he takes the red pill. And that is what God is doing with this very message. You'll either receive it or reject it. You'll either receive the truth that not only has Christ died for you, but you have died in Him, and in receiving this, you begin to live free of the matrix, free of the, the life that you once have lived, and begin to experience and realize what real life is in God, in Christ, living in this love relationship with the God that created you, the God that gave His very Son for you. Colossians gives us this statement of fact. And this is either true or not true. It can't be only true if you believe it. He says in Colossians that you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. I can give you 20 more verses that talk about this throughout the Bible if you want. But I just want you to know that this is a fact. And you'll either receive this as reality or live apart from this as reality. That you no longer live. Our friend Andre says the church needs to remember to drop dead. Because that is what has happened. We have died in Christ. The old self has been crucified in Christ. Just like Paul said. And this is the gospel message. This is the gospel message that not only Christ has died for you, but you too have died. And in doing so, and in receiving this God, you can now have real life, the very life of God, the God that loves you. The hope that we have is not found in a good God forgiving a bad man. We've heard that preached from the pulpit so many times. That's only a partial message. It's not about a good God forgiving a bad man, but it's about a dead man needing the very life of a good God. Right. We were once dead. I love that, that amazing grace. I was once blind, but now I see. Only God gives that. And you guess what? He loves you so much that He's not going to press and push Himself upon you. He's saying, receive me. Receive who I am. He's already hugged you. The word receive is lumbano and it means to, to bring to oneself. Now it says for you to receive Him. And this is the hope of glory that the gospel message that Paul preached. He called this the mystery from all the ages in Colossians 1.26. He says this is the mystery hidden of ages and generations but now revealed to His saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery which is... Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ now living and abiding, Him making your very, His very presence within you. That's the gospel message. And Paul goes on to say, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom. So, going back to the question of that Jesus, when He said it is finished, what was finished? All of mankind was brought into Christ. God reconciled the world unto Himself. And now He calls out through events like this and through just through people having lunch together, now you be reconciled to God. He's done all the work. He's finished it. 
But the part that He will not do is press and push Himself upon you. He invites you. He romances you. He embraces you. Now will you embrace back? I'll end on this verse from John 1.12. It says, But to all who believed Him and received Him, He gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn. This is not a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan. This rebirth comes from God. Father, I ask that you would invade our hearts and minds right now. If there are any that have never understood this message or just seeing it for the first time, that they would embrace you, embrace the very God that lives inside of them that desires to know them and that the Holy Spirit would, would, would call deep into their hearts that they may know you. In Jesus' name, amen.